today we're going to begin a new series. It's called, You Talking to Me? Are you Talking to Me? And we're going to try to address that rather than that being an in-your-face thing. It's going to be, God, you talking to me? You talking to me, God? How does God talk? How does He speak to us? How can we know it's Him? If we hear, if our conscience begins to speak to us, if we feel something, how do we, if somebody says, I have a word from God for you, is it a word from God or they just had a bad burrito and they want to share that with you? Four weeks from now, uh, we're, we're going to see how God has spoken to us. We're, we're going to start off even today how God has spoken in the past, how He's going to speak in the future, and even as we're in this process of building this campus and resources and finances and stuff. I don't want it to be just about the money. I just want that to be a thing that you you just are going, wow, that had to be God because there doesn't seem to be too many people here that are millionaires. There's probably a few, you know. The millionaires usually sit right in the front row and they have shiny heads. (laughs) Just kidding. I had to pick on the two of you there. Okay, all right. So we're starting today with this message, God's plan for you. And I'm so glad we sang the song, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you. And we were teasing about it in practice. It's like, are we going to keep singing He is for you until you get it? Do we need to keep saying that over? Because still some of you don't get it. No, God is not for me. My life sucks. You know, it's not well. And it's like, no, no, that's not true. God is for you. He is for you. Do you know that God has a plan for you? Do you know what that plan is? Maybe we can uncover that just a little bit. Here's what God said to his prophet Jeremiah, again, some almost 3,000 years ago. And he said it to his people who were in trouble. They had turned their backs on God, and God had uh, caused another country to come. And it was just, you talk about a mess they were in a mess. And here's what God said to them through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 11, Great verse to memorize if you don't have it memorized yet. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future. We all, we all need that. Maybe that's all that one of you or two of you need to hear today. You could go home with just that promise that to know that God has a plan and a purpose. And, and in light of everything that's going on in our world today, I think the timing is good for us to be reminded that God's plan includes hope. He'll fill you with hope and a future. Because it seems like our future is looking kind of bleak. And after Tuesday, some of you will be very excited and some of you will be perhaps very depressed, going, oh no, that person is going to lead our country. But, but you know, the truth is, is that God is in charge of everything. He already knows the outcome of the elections, whether it takes two days or two weeks or two months or whatever it takes. As we kick off this series, I want to give to you today three foundational principles. So I'm going to give you several scripture verses today. It'll be kind of like drinking out of a fire hydrant a little bit for some of you. So if you want to take some notes, this would be a perfect time for you to kind of make this a devotional time throughout this week and look at these three principles and own them, claim them, claim God's promises and claim God's blessings. But three foundational principles that we're going to reminded of, be reminded of over and over again over these next four weeks leading up to Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving season. Number one, God's will is much more about who you are than it is about what we do or where we go. God's will is much more about who we are than it is about what we do or where we go. When we think about God's will, we, t- we tend to think about options, don't we? What's God's will? Well, uh, am I supposed to be here or there? Am I, is it him or her? Is it, uh, is it this or that? We start thinking through these options about God's will. But, but I, again, I believe God would say to us today, my will for your life begins with you. Where are you at today with me? My major agenda, God would say, for each of us is not so much where you work or who you marry or where you live, although all of those things are important, 
but it's who you are. Because you could marry the right person, but you might not be the right person, and you might not help that person at all. Or you could be in a different place. Some of you have moved to Moses Lake here recently, and, and again, you, you brought all of, all of you from wherever you moved, and you moved it here. And, and, and it's like, well, some, some of the same things are happening again. It's like, because you're there. You brought you. And so that God would say to us, you are who I'm going to concentrate on. Because if you're not the person that God wants you to be, it doesn't matter where you go or what you do for a living or how much money you make, or it, it won't matter at all. Something's going to be missing. Because God made you on purpose. And he has a plan for you. And it's the, it's the height of arrogance to say, I don't need God. I can do all, life all by myself. I don't need anybody. Some of us have learned that the hard way. Some of us are still in the process of learning that. Oh, yes, you do need God. And one day it'll be really clear. And, and I hope that day is today. You need God. We need God. He created us to need him. Now, if you, if you took your Bible and you looked up all the passages uh, that have the words God's will or God wants or God's desire, and they, and they talk about, you'll find out that they talk a lot more about who you are than about what you do or where you go. And I, I, again, I, we can't take all of them today. We'd be here all afternoon and into tomorrow. But I want to just take a few of them today and just to kind of remind you that God's will is revealed through his word. Let's start with Romans chapter 12, verse 1, because it says it's about your everyday, ordinary life. Anybody got one of those? Everyday, ordinary life. It just seems like, you know, the calendar ticks off. It just goes, there's another day. And what did you do last Friday? I don't know. It's just another day. I got it. Went through the... It's just an everyday, ordinary life. But here's what Romans 12, 1 says, and I love the message translation. We're going to use some different translations. So, in fact, we're even going to use one translation, the EBV, the Ed Burns version. I'll, I'll let you know when that comes because God speaks to me in different ways sometimes and <clears throat> it's a little scary. Okay, Romans 12, 1 in the message translation says this. So, here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your, get this, sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life. Does that include all of us? All of us sleep, eat, go to work, and walk around in life, right? So he's writing to all of us. Take that, he says, and place it before God as an offering, to give it to him as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him to accept what God has given to you. Embrace that your everyday ordinary life uh, is an offering to God that he accepts everything we do and say. And, and he goes on to define that that's worship. We talk about people say, well, you come to church to worship God. Oh, oh no, no, no. This is one way we sing. We sing our praise to God. Worship is the way that you live your life. When you get up in the morning, you have a choice to worship God and say, good morning, Lord. Or you can say, good Lord, it's morning. And it's your choice, and you begin to worship right there. Embracing what God does for us is the best thing that we can do for him. God, thank you for what you've given to me. Thank you for the blessing. That's what being a living sacrifice is all about. We talk about here in a different translation of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Embracing what God wants us to do every day. So we put our own wants and desires on hold and say, God, I want what you want for me first. Then he goes on in verse 2 to say that we need to fix your attention on God and you will be changed from the inside out. To fix your attention on God and you will be changed from the inside out. And this is really a God thing. You can't make this up on your own. This is a God thing. Here's verse 2. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. I think maybe there's a good place for us to start with what's going on in our world today. People have forgotten how to think. We just react. Oh, and you hear this grumping and griping about 
all, especially during the election season. Maybe, maybe it'll change after a few weeks, but I mean, man, we got the grumpiest grind. It's, it's all like, without even thinking, we just respond. Instead, he says, fix your attention on God. There's nothing that your God can't do. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. There's another good word for what's gone immature. God brings the best out of you. He develops well-formed maturity in you. Do you know that God wants you to grow up? Just grow up. Maybe you could help that person next to you and say, God wants you to grow up. Would you just grow up? You just need to grow up. That's what he wants for us. That's what's best for us. Immaturity, again, is is a great word for us to describe our society today. Whatever I want is most important, and you better not get in my way, because I'll let you know. I'll let you know what I think. But being changed from the inside out, again, that's a God thing, and it's really cool to see, and I've seen it in some of you. And hopefully through the years, it's happened in me, too, that I'm a different person than I was without Jesus. I was very selfish, and and, and I still have to struggle with that at times, but God's changed me from the inside out. God's changing you from the inside out. It's it's a miracle that God does in us. Um, The the fruit of being filled with God's Spirit kind of stands out. Uh, in a stark difference to, to the way that would you and I would act normally. Love and joy. That doesn't come naturally, but to be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, those, they don't come naturally. That's God working on you from the inside out. And you'll hear a still small voice every once in a while when you're about to let somebody have it, and then it's like, I probably shouldn't say that. You know who's, who's saying that to you? But back off, Jack. Take a chill pill. Slow down. That would be God's Holy Spirit saying to you, you don't, you don't, need, to, we, I don't, I, we don't need to hear your opinion every time something comes out. Just slow down. Self-control. That's God working on the inside of you in how you treat people, and how you respond when life doesn't go the way you want it to. This this whole coronavirus deal is bringing out the worst in people and the best in people. It's whatever is inside a person is coming out because we've all got opinions and what's happening and what's not happening. And, And of course, in this time of the election too, that's not the best time for us to see all the good stuff in us because We've got opinions, boy, that's for sure. And whatever is inside you just kind of spills out naturally. Maybe just to your family, maybe to your church family, maybe to the people you work with, um, but it spills out. It's in there and it comes out. Well, then there's this verse here in 1 Thessalonians that I really like. One of the first verses that I memorized as a young believer because it was only two words, and so I could do those, you know, the, the little verses. But uh, in 1 Thessalonians, he talks about always rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Always rejoice, pray, and give thanks. And he didn't say always rejoice, always pray, always give thanks. He, he changed up the words a little bit. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he said rejoice always, pray continually, which is just another word for always, okay, continually, uh, give thanks in all circumstances, which is another word for always, okay, always, always, for this is, what? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You ever ask God for his, God, I just want your will, and I want your will to be done in my life. Well, here it is. Here it is. God says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, again, to, to know God's will for us is to embrace joy constantly. That, that you would live a lifestyle of dependence on prayer. That the first thing you do when a situation comes that's beyond you, you pray rather than worry. 
Worry, if you know how to worry, you know how to pray. Worry is depending upon yourself and praying is depending upon God. And, and, and this scripture here, Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he says, you need to always pray. You need to do that first. First you pray. First you pray. No matter what comes your way, first thing you do is pray. And then no matter what the circumstances are, you would be thankful because you would know that God is working out a bigger picture than what you can see. <clears throat> so when your car blows up or breaks down, you just go, Okay, Lord, well, you gave me the car anyway. Well, we're going work, to work this out somehow. Uh, we'll, we'll get the car thing. Because God just wants you to be thankful for what you have. It's God's will for your life. And what about when you think you've met your soulmate? You know, maybe you've met Mr. Right or Miss Perfect, and it's a perfect fit for you. And the sparks are flying, and, and you want to take it to the next level, What's God's will in that whole thing? And then Paul says again to the Thessalonians, you need to avoid sexual immorality. She might be Miss Perfect fit for you right now, but let's stay away from the sexual stuff. That's designed for marriage. Here's what he says. He says, it is God's will. You want to know God's will? It is God's will that you should be sanctified, a word that means set apart for God. Another word for holy that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. God's will, self-control. It's a result of being filled with God's Spirit. It's part of that fruit of the Spirit to be self-controlled. What we do with our bodies is supposed to be holy and honorable. That's God's will for each of us. And we can change it from sexual to even um, our appetites and stuff. What we do with our body, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We walk around representing God. And sometimes the billboards on our lives don't, don't say what we say we believe. Our bodies are to be holy and honorable. That's God's will for us. And then what about when people are mean and selfish to us. Um, can, we, can we just do to them what they do to us? Isn't, didn't Jesus say, do to others as, you, as they do to you? Isn't that kind of what he said? Kind of, more or less. Well, kind of, but not quite. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Not do to them what they do to you. But God wants us to always walk in the way of love. Walk in the way of love. Ephesians 5, 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus says there's no greater than love than to give your life up for somebody else. And then he did exactly that. He gave his life up for us. And then he said, I want you to follow me and I want you to do for others what I have done for you. I want you to love other people the way that I loved you. Being willing to give your very life for other people. If we follow his example, we'll walk in the way of love. And again, Paul writes the whole 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter and what love does and what love does not do. And, and, and again, that's the will of God for us, that we walk in the way of love. And again, there are many, many more references in God's word about God's will and what God wants for us. And if you look at them, again, you're going to see over and over again that the focus is more on who he wants us to be, much more than he want, what he wants us to do for a living or where he wants us to move. He, God would rather, much rather be a, a sculptor in our lives than a traffic cop. Uh, he wants to shape us and to, to mold us into something incredible. Not just stand at the intersection of our lives with a whistle or with a flashlight trying to point us in the right direction. And sometimes in our prayer lives, that's all we want. God, just tell me what to do. Would you just tell me what to do? And it's like, I'm molding you. I'm shaping you. And every day I'm helping you to become the person I want you to become. God is an artist. And you and I are his masterpieces. That's hard for us to accomplish. And we have an enemy 
to for for our, you know that that hates God, that Satan hates God, and he hates you if you're trying to serve God. So he's going to keep telling you how stupid and ugly and horrible you are, and you're not a masterpiece. You're a mess. And God whispers quietly to us, "No, you're not. You're my masterpiece. I created you on purpose and with a purpose." So that's the first foundational principle. The second one uh, for knowing God's plan is this. God wants us to desire him more than his answers for our life. God wants us to desire him more than his answers for our life. When you and I are going through a dilemma and and you have a lot of questions, um, do, do you start giving God ultimatums? Do you pray that way sometimes? Do you start giving God deadlines? Okay, God. Maybe your prayer starts sounding like demands. God, you need to do this. God, you said you'd do this. Here's the promise, and this is, and you need to. God, what is your problem? You ever pray that way? <clears throat> God, I realize you're God and all, but I need an answer. I need it right now. I need to know what you want me to do right now. Come on, God, show up. <laughs> and maybe we even try to threaten God. Or we play the whiny baby game. God, don't you love me? If you loved me, you'd answer me. You'd give me. You'd help me. You'd... You ever play that game with God? If you loved me, you'd do this, and then we tell God what he needs to do to love us as if he doesn't know how to love us in the most perfect way. We, we actually try to control God. Maybe that's why we don't like to pray so much. Because after we're done praying, it seems like we're just talking to the ceiling. And if we're telling God what to do, that's exactly what we're doing, talking to the ceiling. God, you got to do this. And I just keep thinking, I'm learning lessons through my grandsons again, you know, for them to try to tell me what to do. It's like, oh man, I could knock you out right now. I could just knock you right out. But they know what's best for them, you know, each one of them in their own little way. And you, if you have little people in your house, they know what's best. Don't they for them? And you just feel like sometimes as the dad or the grandpa, I could just knock you right into tomorrow. That's one of our little phrases with the boys. I'm going to knock you into tomorrow. We're just going to forget about today. You're having a bad day. I'm going to knock you into tomorrow. I'm just glad God doesn't do that to us. (laughs) And so I think when we do begin to demand from God what what he should do, God asks us that same question that Jesus asked Peter. Do you remember after Peter denied him, uh, then uh, uh, after Jesus came back from the dead, he uh, asked Peter that day on the beach three times. He said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? That's what's most important to God, that we love him, not that we just get his answers and seek his answers. Do you trust me, God would say to you and I, or do you just need an answer for the dilemma you're going through? Because if I just answer the dilemma you're going through, probably, if, if, if history is any indication, once you get your answer, then I don't see you again for three months. I don't see you again until you get into a problem, and then you come back and you're so needy and you want me to help you, you want another answer. And then once I give you the answer, you're gone again, and I don't see you. I don't know how many parents really appreciate their kids always asking them for stuff. Never wanting to be with them, never wanting to spend time. But boy, if it comes to, I need this, I need that, then it's like, I'm right there. What am I going to get? What, what, what about me? And we have to teach our children not to be selfish because aren't we all selfish? <clears throat> so what's, what's our track record? When, when do you pray? Only if you need something? Only if you're in trouble? It's it's when we come into God's presence and draw close to Him. It's then that the answers of life start to come around. And again, it's that miracle of God from the inside out. You begin to think differently when you're in the presence of God Almighty. I think that's why some people love to come and gather as a church congregation because something happens. We sing songs that we don't normally sing, perhaps. We think about God for an hour at least in a way maybe that we don't the rest of our lives. 
because we're so busy. We have so many things to go, and places to go, people to see. There was a man named Nicholas Herman who was dissatisfied with his life. He ended up uh, getting a job peeling potatoes and washing dishes, you know, being that kind of a cook. Um, really, really sad. He, didn't, he had a, this go-nowhere job. He didn't know what to do. Life just wasn't working. And so he decided that he was going to try a little experiment. And he decided that his relationship with God was more important than what he did or how much money he made. So he decided that he would just practice the presence of God in everything he did. Again, whether it was washing dishes, peeling potatoes, washing his car, which he didn't have one at that time. Uh, no matter what he was doing, he was just going to practice the presence of God. And, and it began to change him from the inside out. And, and, it, and so much so that people started wanting to be around him. There was just something about Nicholas that they wanted to be around. And they couldn't maybe put their finger on it exactly, but he had something that they wanted. He had a peace. He had a joy. He had an understanding of life. They even changed his name and they began to call him Brother Lawrence. Perhaps you've heard of Brother Lawrence. After Brother Lawrence died, his friends gathered up all, the, all of his writings, all the little scraps of paper, all the tablets and his uh, journals, and they put them into a book and that book has sold millions of copies. It's called the practice of the presence of God. If that's a book you haven't read yet, I would just recommend that to you. It's just practicing God. Really very, very uh, natural, no practicing the presence of it. Let's just pretend for a minute that God is here. Is that okay? God is in the house. God is in your house. God, what do you want me to do? in your ordinary, everyday life, in your eating, in your sleeping, in your sitting, in your going. Here's what uh, Brother Lawrence wrote in one of his books, in that book, practice, The Practice of the Presence of God. He says, The most holy and necessary practice in our spiritual life is the presence of God. And that means finding constant pleasure in His divine company, speaking humbly, and lovingly with him in all situations at every moment without limiting the conversation in any way. Just being in God's presence. That's uh, called praying without ceasing. Always praying. King David understood this because King David wrote this. Uh, he said, I only have one request in my life. I just, one thing. He said, I, I just want to know God. I, I just want to know God. It's recorded in Psalm 27, verse 4. He says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. An artistic way to say, I just, I just want to know God. I just want to be with God. That's the only thing I need really need from God. If you could ask God one thing today, what, what, what would it be? Just one thing. God, just one thing I want. You got something? Would, would it be to answer some tough question that you have? Would it be to solve some dilemma that you're going through? God, I really need this. I really do. God, you know I need, 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 I need. Jesus said if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then everything else will fall into place. If you'll seek me first, not second, not third, not 102nd or 103rd. It's out of that personal friendship, that relationship with God, that answers to our lives begin to flow. And God begins to make sense out of some things that are happening that didn't make any sense. Maybe you look back a year ago or two years ago, and you go, oh, that's what he was doing. Oh, okay, I, I, I get that now. We're just not as smart as God is. So if we spend time with him, if I just want to know God, if that's really my desire, then he will begin to work 
in us from the inside out. And he promises that he will guide and watch over you. Guide and watch over you. Psalm 32, 8 says this. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Isn't that good to know that God will guide us along the best path? He will advise us and watch over us? Isn't that good to know? Don't you want to know a God like that? Don't you want to spend a little time with a God like that? Not just any old pathway in life, but the best pathway for our lives. He will guide us and advise us and watch over us. Sounds like a good parent, something a good parent would do, doesn't it? Guide, advise, and watch over us. That's why Jesus, when he taught us how to pray, he said to refer to God as our heavenly father. He's a good parent. He's a good, good father. He's a perfect dad. He wants the very best for you. That's why you can approach him and say, Heavenly Father, or Daddy. You can just say Daddy. Now, the very next verse, again, we're, talk, we're, we're talking, the psalmist is trying to help us understand who God is. The very next verse is, is important advice for us. And again, I'm going to use the, the EBV the Ed Burns version of this, because the next verse, it says, don't be a jackass. You don't think that's in the Bible, do you? You don't think it is, do you? Okay, I'm going to have Sergio put it up. Here it is. Here's what it says. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. <clears throat> Isn't that what he means? In the EB version, didn't you get it the same way? I got it. It kind of popped right out. Sometimes when it comes to following God and trusting Him, we act like senseless mules, don't we? We're stubborn, we're going to do our way. And God says, I don't want you to be that way. When we begin to learn that knowing God and practicing His presence is what is the most important thing for us, then the answers for our lives that we need will come with regularity. And you'll begin to experience peace and it'll be little things that used to bug you a year or two or five years it just drove you crazy and it's like, that's nothing. It's, not, it's just not that important. I'm not going to get all worked up about it. I don't know, were any of you here four years ago when we went through an election process? Do you remember all the junk going on then and guess what's happening again this year and four years before that and we had that president four years before that and and the whole country was going to hell in a handbasket because then we had that guy and then we had that guy and isn't that something and every four years we kind of wind it all up again and we're right there two days from now it'll all kind of hit the fan and then it'll settle down and then they're already talking about 2024 have you noticed that like, yeah, well, well, this is going to happen. But 2024, then we're really going to get somebody. Like, you know what's going to happen in four years, don't you? I mean, it's going to be the same old thing. And he didn't, she didn't, it didn't. It's like, <laughs> we just do the same old thing. <clears throat> when will we learn? Okay, principle number three is this. It is not as much about finding God's will as it is to follow God's voice. It's not as much about finding God's will as it is to follow God's voice. We started off today uh, saying, God saying, I know I have pl the plans that I have for you. But, but we say, yeah, that's good that you know, God. I want to know him. I want to know. I want to be in control. I want to know what you want me to do. I don't want to just trust you. I'm getting sick and tired of just trusting you. I want to know. You would never say that to God, would you? Maybe not out loud. Specific plans. God, right now, I need to know what you want me to do right now. I don't want to just trust you. I mean, trusting you, that sounds so religious, doesn't it? I mean, trusting God. We're going to trust God. No, make up your mind, just do it. <laughs> and God says, I want you to... Seek first the kingdom of God. Yeah, I want my kingdom. I seek first the kingdom of God. Isn't that something how we do that? <laughs> we, can, we can all learn from Jesus' first followers. 
but you don't have to have all the answers before you follow. You don't have to have all the answers before you follow. Listen to what Jesus said to his guys. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. That's the way they fished back then. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. What the stink did he mean by that? They didn't know. I'm going to fish for people. Like mermaids? What are we talking here? We're going to fish for people here. They didn't know. At once they left their nets and followed him. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where they were going to live. They didn't have a car. They didn't have a mule. But they followed. They followed him. (laughs) Jesus had a plan. They knew that Jesus had a plan And that was enough for them. They put their trust in him and simply followed him. Now, was it all perfect? No, no. They did some really foolish things and never really did believe in him until after he was resurrected. A whole lot of stress will leave your life and mine when it is enough to know that God has a master plan for your life and you don't have to know it. God's in control. I'm going to put my trust in God. He knows what's best. I don't have to know everything. There's just kind of a sense of the weight comes off. It's like, ah, I don't have to know everything. Because you can't. We need to simply learn that to listen and then follow. Listen and then follow. Jesus said it like this. He said in John 10, 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I don't know if any of you are shepherds and how shepherds work with sheep and stuff. But uh, Jesus says, my sheep are good listeners. They know what I'm saying. They follow me. Now, I'm I'm told, and I looked it up on Google, so you can find this out if, if it's true or not. Again, if you're a shepherd, sheep have very poor depth perception. That's why if you see YouTube videos, sometimes they'll jump off cliffs, they'll run into walls. They just do, it's like, you stupid sheep, what's wrong with you? Well, they they can't see very well. The depth perception is off. They can see behind them. They have a great peripheral vision, but they they can't see in front of them. And so they run into things, but they have very, very good ability to listen. They They can hear real well. And so, uh, they, they compensate for poor eyesight with this excellent sense of hearing. They would recognize a shepherd's voice even when they couldn't see him. They would listen to his voice. And in that way, Jesus is saying to us, I want you to be like sheep. Because you know what? You don't see very good. You look out there and you, you run into things, don't you? You keep running into the same, you keep doing the same thing. What's wrong with you? Sheep. You sheep, you, you can't see. <laughs> and he says, That's, I, I know, I made you that way. You can't see into the future, but, but I can. If you'll just listen, if you'll just listen to me, I'll lead you. And even when you can't see where you're going, you can trust me, and I will lead you where you need to go. Would you just trust me? That's why David said in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd he was saying I'm like sheep I can't see you. my depth perception is not very good and I run into things that, but I can listen the one thing I want is I just want to know God that's what I need to get through this life one time God asked Elijah a question, a question that, that I believe he is asking every one of us today we'll wrap up with this and God said to Elijah what are you doing here? And then I left it blank on purpose because I want you to write your name in. What are you doing here, Susan? What, 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 what are you doing here, Stella? What are you doing here? What are you, why, why are you where you're at in your life right now? What, what are you doing here? Now listen to how God spoke to Elijah and know this. At this time in Elijah's life, God had done some tremendous things in his life But at this time, he was very discouraged. And he just wanted to quit. Even run away. Even said to God, just take my life. I'm done. I've done everything I can do. I can't do anything else. And God spoke to him. Like I think he wants to speak to you and me today. 
1 Kings 19 as it's recorded. And the Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. In other words, God, Elijah, I want to tell you something. I want to talk to you. Will you listen? I want to tell you something. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. That's nothing for God. He can do that. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Think you an earthquake would get our attention, perhaps? A hurricane get our attention, perhaps? After the earthquake came a fire. You think of all the woods, all the forest got on fire? Hmm. But the Lord was not in the fire. After that, after the fire came a, get this now, gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? You to run away from all your challenges? You run away from all the problems? And then if you go on to the story, it's interesting because God kind of treats Elijah like a preschooler. And he says, go take a nap. Here, have some food to eat. Do that again. Go take another nap. He just, he just treats him like a little preschooler. This is a prophet of God who is discouraged and depressed just like you and I get sometimes. God often doesn't speak through spectacular events. Oh, he can, and we like those. When God does something spectacular, we go, oh, was that that the coolest thing ever? We like that. But often he just whispers, and, and we have to listen in order to hear his voice. And maybe he's just whispering to you and to nobody else. Nobody else will get it. God said this to you. It's like, he didn't say that to me. God is not silent. God is always speaking. But when we are busy with all the important stuff in our lives, we don't hear him. That's why God said in Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Do you want to know the EB version of that one? Shut up. Shut up. And know that I am God. I'm God. For heaven's sake, would you just be still? That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard for you guys to do it here. You sit here and be still, and some of, you just can't do it. You fall asleep sometimes. I, and I don't blame you. I mean, I, I would too. If I was out here listening to me, I'd fall asleep. I'd be like, okay, yeah. Right, is he done yet? <laughs> It's okay. But God would say to us, stop running around so much, trying to do so much. Unplug from some of the noise around you. Can you unplug from the internet? Can you unplug from your cell phone? Isn't it really tough? Where's my cell phone? Where's my? You know where your cell phone? You know exactly where your cell phone is, don't you? Because you do. It's just like it's all there, and all the. It's like having the newspaper there, and having the encyclopedias are right there. You can look up everything. You can check the weather. You can check all kinds of. You can listen to another sermon while this sermon's going on. You can just multitask. And I heard a definition about multitasking that I thought I'd pass on to you today. Multitasking means you can't do anything very well. You just do it all, don't you? Just you're just going and looking at pictures and looking at that and checking this and. Instagram's got new Facebook, new this, and all that. And it's just like, and God is saying, would you just put the cell phone down? Turn off, disconnect the internet. Listen, I have a plan for you. It's filled with hope and a bright future. Listen, be still. So, some of us maybe need to do a little reordering in our lives uh, in order to hear what God is saying to us. And so the question would be, are you willing? Are you willing to take God at his word? He says, be still and know that I'm God. Be still. You just, you got to do that. Well, yeah, I can do that while I'm uh, listening on the internet. I can listen to, read the internet. I can read my Facebook. I can do all that kind of stuff and still listen to God. Uh, okay, well, give that a shot. 
See how that works for you. God says, be still. So, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with what you just heard? These three principles that I gave, we're going to re- I'll remind you of those again next week. We're going to talk about uh, Joseph's life. We're going, to talk, but we're going to just talk about how God has worked in people's lives in the past and how he wants to work in the, in the present. So, for one minute, I just want you to be still and know that God wants to say something to you right now. Maybe he already has, and you just need to go, yep, I get it, I hear you, I hear you, God, you said it again for the thousandth time today, I got it. And if you want to write it on your Connect card, if you want us to pray for you about that thing, you can put it in the offering box, that would be awesome, we'll pray for you this week. If not, it's just between you and God, and on the back side of your Connect card, I gave you a couple of ideas that maybe God would say, yeah, this is what you need to do, maybe you need to memorize that verse. Maybe that's what you need. Just would you just memorize that one verse? Be still and know that I am God. It's not very hard. It's not not very long. Be still, be still and know that I am God. Maybe that's what you need to do. So for one minute, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna be still and let God speak to you in that still, quiet voice. So let's just be quiet for one minute. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the plans that you have for each of us who is here today. You have a perfect plan for us if we'll listen to you and Lord we admit that we don't understand how it works always how it's from the inside out we want to know from the outside in we want to see the plan we want to see it ahead of us we want to see it mapped out and then we can go for it and get excited about it and and then maybe the feelings will come afterwards but we want to know and Lord you've switched the script on us and you want to do it from the inside us and make us people that hear from you and we're changed from the inside. Would, would you help us, Lord, to readjust the outside part of our lives, the schedules, to, to make time so that we can be still before you, so that we can hear from you. Even if nobody around us understands that we just need a little, little God time, a little, little time to just be still and listen. I pray that you would help us to follow you instead of just going through life as what, as what we think best or what other, just kind of go along with what everybody else is doing and just everybody's doing that, so I'm going to get caught up in that. Lord, we want to know you. That, that's why we're here today. That's why we set this time aside to come today to say, okay, God, what do you, what do you want to say? So I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that as we were still just even for this minute, you spoke and, and you said something to us about how we can make some adjustments, how we can make some decisions maybe differently than we've been doing so that we can honor you with our lives. Thank you, God, for your truth that sets us free. I pray, God, that you would help us now to walk out of this place with, a, with, a, with an assurance that you have a plan and with the assurance that if we're still before you, you will speak to us. Thank you, God. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.